Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar session. Uh, I'm excited to have our presenters here with us today uh, on our topic, How to Halt Hackers with Huntress and Duo. Uh, I want to make sure that we get to dive right into today's content. Our speakers have a whole lot to share with you. So just before we do, a real quick bit of housekeeping. Uh, hopefully, you are able to hear my voice, to see our presenters' lovely faces, and to see the slides that are being shared. Uh, if that is not true, there's a screenshot here of the audio menu. Uh, you can choose either to use mic, mic and speakers through VoIP or a telephone option to dial in. Also, we do want today's presentation to be interactive and relevant to the questions that you have. The best way for us to find that out is for you to ask them. So you do have a question section of your GoToWebinar menu, and we encourage you as we go through today's presentation to add any questions that you have there. If we are still on that portion of the material, I will try and cut in and ask while we're in the moment. Otherwise, we are holding time at the end of today's session to get through as many of those questions as possible. Finally, today's presentation is being recorded and you will receive a uh, link to the recording uh, by tomorrow after uh, today's session. And without further ado, I'd love to introduce my teammate, Jeremy Young, uh, who is joining from the duo side today. Jeremy's been in the IT industry, uh, working with uh, channel partners for 10 plus years. Uh, at HP, he learned the ins and outs of the hardware business. And at Verizon, he de developed a thorough understanding of business networks and communications. Uh, these varied paths led him to Duo Security, a cybersecurity company focused on getting the right users on the right devices, easy access to the applications they need in order to succeed in their jobs. Jeremy, that sounds like a pretty good company. I'd probably buy stuff from them. I think so. Uh, so thanks, Zoe. Nice to see you guys today. Thank you, everybody, for joining. I, it's my pleasure to introduce Kyle Hanslevin. So Kyle is the CEO and founder of Huntress Labs, comes from the U.S. intelligence community where he supported defensive and offensive cybersecurity operations for the past decade, actively participates in ethical hacking community as a Black Hat Conference trainer, STEM mentor, and DEF CON CTF champion. Additionally, he serves in the Maryland Air National Guard as a cyber warfare operator at this stage. He's focused on making hackers earn every inch of their access to the networks that he protects. Kyle, I'm tired just reading that. Thank you yeah. for uh, your service to com the community and the MSP community. And a uh, little about yourself, and, and you've got some teammates on. You're not the only one from the U.S. Com intelligence community at Huntress, are you? No, no. So there's a, there's a handful of us, myself, my two co-founders, and some of the employees as well. That's awesome, man. Uh, well, thank you all, the attendees, for joining us. There's a lot of partners on the line today. And this is going to be partner oriented, but it's really going to be relevant to anyone uh, who is interested in cybersecurity and the threats that we're seeing out there in uh, in the community. So let's start with the first poll question. We want to get an idea of the uh, the markets and the verticals that our MSPs are serving. So if you're on and you should be able to see a quick poll, if, uh, if let's talk about which vertical you guys are on. So please go ahead and... Uh, mark your choices. While that's happening, Kyle, uh, who have you got on today from Huntress? So Jeremy, I got a handful of folks, both from our uh, our engineering side of the house, so specifically like the hunters that both reverse engineer malware, hunt down some of the, the trade craft that we, we, you know, we run into on a daily basis, uh, but also half of our team that also does the offensive research into our own product along with our marketing team. So it really is a kind of an all hands effort today. Awesome. And uh, from the duo side, we also have some security and technical resources. Uh, Scott McDonald, MSP SE, is on, and Jack uh, Rob will be joining us as well. Uh, it looks like we're getting some sort of results in. So large, um, most is other, which is probably, uh, could have guessed that, right? MSPs serve a lot of different verticals, but we do have quite a bit of healthcare, 17% healthcare, 17% financial, fewer on the legal side, 6%, but 59% other. So uh, let's go ahead and close that poll and hop back in. So Jeremy, I'm going to use this info today, uh, especially part of the live hacking demonstration. Always the things that hit closest to home are ones that relate to the target audience. So I'll make sure I kind of turn that dial uh, as we're explaining how some of this stuff is used. Awesome. And I am going to make myself the presenter and start showing my main screen again. All right. Uh, so you guys know what the agenda is today. That's why we're here, but we're gonna start talking about uh, the threats impacting the MSP community and actually have a live demo. So Kyle's gonna help us peel back some layers of the onion 
uh, and actually dive into what's really happening. We see a lot of industry headlines. Uh, we're going to take a look at what's really going on. We're also going to see what MFA does to the most common points of entry on those attacks. And then we're going to cover uh, a different way to look at selling cybersecurity and what the basics are that should be built into your managed services instead of maybe a bolt-on security offering. So we've seen for a while now, like the end of last year, I think October it was, Homeland Security started talking to us about and warning us that service providers are going to be a target and have been a target and trying to make uh, make everybody more aware so we could start and continue to harden our internal security and that of our customers. We started seeing uh, information coming out that really said this is a true, this is happening. Early in February, ConnectWise plugin to Kaseya VSA was targeted. Uh, we then saw WePro, and uh, I know Kyle's going to talk more about that in the live demo, but a lot of this was stemming from stolen credentials and phishing attacks. That WePro attack didn't just impact them, impacted PCM, ServiceNow. Those are some of the ones that you recognize, but this, uh, the same techniques involved here are involved in a lot of other uh, attacks on MSPs that you may not know the names of. More recently, uh, while both the Huntress and Duo teams were out at DatoCon in San Diego, we saw this one come out, uh, and they were actually using Kaseya and Webroot, uh, using the software for, in a legitimate way for illegitimate purposes. And uh, Kyle, you've been involved in the remediation and kind of unpacking a lot of these. What we with well, the frequency has been turned up to 11, right? What's going on? Yeah, so it's getting a little silly, right? It's uh, it's flat out to the point that um, it's just hard to be perfect always. I think a lot of us uh, tend to lose focus that um, you know, security is important at the same time. You can only provide so much that you know, meets your own customer's margins, right? It's, it's real easy to say, just add another layer, add another layer. Yeah. I think the, the goal, Jeremy, when you and I were brainstorming before this was, let's do a demo, let's show people why the layers that make sense should be focused not just on prevention, but also on like you know that ounce of prevention is a pound of cure, and if you do have to you know have some of the more proactive response and detection, you know how's that right layer? So I think you're right. It's been amped so up. When you see these headlines and you see all these like red triangles, it's supposed to elicit a certain response. We're not trying to uh, get you based on fear because that leads to uh, visceral responses that can emotional responses that can say, hey, look that scary things are happening, somebody is actually hacking, that they're targeting that one company. What's really happening? It's a lot of one-to-many responses. It's a lot of like just mass phishing attacks, trying to find regular credentials, maybe password spraying, uh, brute forcing RDP. It's one-to-many things that anybody could fall victim to, and they're not, once they get access, if you're using the right credentials, it's much harder to detect it as something nefarious. So without, we're going to look at one more poll question to pull the audience to see uh, how or what uh, threats the audience is most concerned about right now. So Kyle, you want to walk us through some of these uh, that we're looking at, some of the poll yeah. responses? Yeah, so, so some of my favorite, right, is I always tend to ask these questions, right, of, when I meet a partner, whether it's one they just had an incident or maybe we're just hanging BS and trying to understand our business, I always ask them a question. Usually first it starts out with your business, right? What's your, your biggest thing that's preventing you from making more profit? Um, every now and then you, you hear some of the things that's just like organization structure, but kind of for the last 18 months, so there's been a lot of focus on how do you weaponize security? Not just for the sake of like better resiliency and making sure customers are staying up and running, but how can we make a little bit more money in the process? How can we provide better security? Uh, but when I ask the next question, which is this one here, right? What's your, your greatest endpoint security concerns? Oftentimes it's a blank look. Uh, so what I've done is I've distilled, you know, a, a handful of conversations at DatoCon and probably a hundred conversations over the years that typically I get roughly four answers, which is somewhere like, oh man, I know I had these event logs or firewall logs or even other logs, but I'm not really watching them. Um, more and more because the volume has been amped up so high in regards to these RMM tools or just legitimate administration tools being abused, 
I think we'll probably see some bias in today's uh, you know, poll that's going <laughs> to see that trusted admin tools is going to be high up there because it's on everybody's mind. But I and, think the reality is kind of all four of these, I would be just as happy to see 25% each category rather than just one. I, I think they're all a concern, right? You know, is the reality. You, you bring up a good point and something that you'll hear me say a lot is we need to move as an industry from bolt-on solutions to built-in solutions. And so if you have a log mod, if you have a SIM, the greatest SIM engine in the world is only as good as the eyes on glass you have behind it. And so even if you have a SIM engine checking out all those, gla uh, those logs, what are you going to do when you see something and what's noise versus what's real? So a lot of coming at security from a bolt-on approach is, is one way to do it, but it, there's a better way. So it looks like we have some results and uh, not quite 25% in every category, but we got 20% unmonitored event logs, 29 abused uh, trusted admin tools, 11 reused local admin passwords, and 39 ransomed files. And I think that's probably, uh, given that we just put those headlines up, that that is kind of predictable, right? Yeah, I, I definitely get it there. So what I'm going to do is, um, with that being the concern, I'm going to try to also pull that into the hacking demo today because I kind of got a handful of VMs. I kind of prepared for, I knew the audience was going to have some of this. So I think the videos I select, the demonstration, and that should be a hell of a lot better, Jeremy, when you and I are talking about how do you actually turn these knobs, for instance, in security. Um, I think this is kind of the best questions we could have asked and kind of got the best results. So huge thanks to everybody. And maybe one thing to reiterate is while I'm doing the hacking demo here in just a little bit, questions are, are, are you know, kind of what allow all of us here on the conversation to learn, right? The typical webinar is here's some death by PowerPoint. Neither Duo nor Huntress goes by that typical model. So uh, Jeremy- hey, speak for yourself, man. I love PowerPoint. Oh, okay. <laughs> Alrighty, so let's get this some of the fun going. I always tend to want my demonstrations to be, you know, something that we could reproduce at home. So for the sake of this uh, environment here, I've got nothing more than administrative, uh, you know, Windows 10 machine that has both a local user login and, and the default administrator account. On my other machine, though, I, I've got, you know, typical Kali Linux. So for anybody who's not uh, um, kept up with this, right, for instance, if we go take a look in this, uh, you know, this is just a free system administration or pen testing framework that you could do all kinds of shenanigans from, right? In this example, I've got Kali Linux installed, but I'm going to use a handful of tools here to start. So, Jeremy, when you're thinking about most, uh, you know, I think of, of incidents or breaches, we always tend to feel it's so tailored to us, or maybe it's not tailored to us. Within the SMB, I think most of our partners. Uh, kind of got a grasp that sometimes it's just as much about targeting a customer or targeting a partner as it is just by happenstance, right? That, you know, nobody plans to get attacked by a bear. You just happen to walk through the woods and you were the slowest one of the packs so that you were the one that got ate, right? Um, so my goal of this is to kind of show, right? And so anybody who's never used any of Kali Linux or any of these free penetration testing tools, um, there's some really neat tools in there. One of them is called Nmap. It's a way to be able to address and you could give it like, uh, you know, whole CIDR notation to say, hey, scan everything in this external range or internal range. But for the sake of the demonstration here, I just wanted to start with a tool that, you know, its whole goal is to try to assess everything about my remote host. Keep in mind here, my remote host that I'm talking about, my victim machine is this lovely Windows 10 machine. And guys, I know Kyle isn't into uh, shameless self-promotion, so I'll do it for him. He, the Huntress team does a lot of boot camps at, uh, or whatever major events you go to throughout the year, if you have the chance to sign up for one of these boot camps, you're going to get an intensive on them walking you through and showing you how to do this hands-on demonstrations of what hackers are doing trying to get into your environments. So if 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 you haven't, if you have the, a chance to attend one, do it. Gotcha. So I'm gonna, Jeremy. Thanks for that plug there. And you know, part of hacking, right? It's it's never the uh, you know, when I think of all my favorite movies, right, Swordfish Hackers, you, you, know, you always get this like instantaneous, oh, success, right? But the reality is you see me here clicking away, trying to just get an update. We're 93% done with the scan. But my whole goal here is I want to learn more about what's running on my Windows uh, 10 system, right? I want to know what's, what's undergoing, what, what does it provide? Uh, you know, is SMB open? Let's be real, it's 2019, we shouldn't have SMB open. The next side of it is what, what about more realistic services? So I'm not going to give away too much here, but I just wanted everybody to understand 
uh, you know, why we're scanning this machine. And the goal is for us to start you know, interactively pivoting. And where I kind of, Jeremy, I would love for you to pivot or be able to, to bring up here is, you know, why we're doing it or what we're doing. Um, and, and maybe where you see opportunity for two factor. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is, uh, while this is scanning, I'm never a fan of just sitting there waiting. For anybody who hadn't seen our previous video, um, the reason this is hitting so close to home is in one of our previous webinars we did with Huntress, we showed all kinds of incidents where attackers were getting into MSP's networks, abusing legitimate tools and doing nefarious things. So I'm going to do a real quick, uh, you know, recap of one of these machines. And then what we're going to do is we're going to highlight four more videos today of other incidents where two-factor could have played a, you know, a legitimate um, you know, stopping mechanism or actually halt these hackers before hunters had to get involved and find them slipping by. And so, Kyle, how did you get these videos? So this was uh, an MSP partner of ours. Unfortunately, they came in and uh, you know, they, they came to us and said, hey, look, um, we had our Screen Connect software, right? Our remote administration software compromised. It was a standardized password or a leaked password or a lost password. Bottom line, the password was compromised and there wasn't a two-factor authentication set and um, to be able to prevent the attacker from gaining control of Screen Connect. So to be clear, it wasn't the a it wasn't a breach of the software. It was somebody using an actual credential to get in to the software. Yeah, you're hitting the nail on the head, right? So we see the attacker here getting into the point of sale machine, trying to figure out their way around. And I think we all know where this is going to go, right? Uh, we, we know the attacker is eventually going to figure out what's going on, but you're, you hit the nail on the head. This attacker didn't throw some like zero day exploit that managed to compromise Screen Connect. They just abused the legitimate functionality and somewhere they got a credential. Uh, and the same case happened on those other examples that we talked about in previous webinars you alluded to earlier, right? The, the WebRoot management console, the Kaseya incident, none of those were credentials either, which is part of what you know really fired you and I up to kind of show a little bit more about how are the hackers doing this? How are they brute forcing or how might they be getting passwords? So I really wanted to kick this off to get everybody on the same page, right? So here's an attacker that's actually installing, right? Some back doors. Um, and the reality is when we find incidents like this at Huntress, our typical MO is you've got your awesome preventative software in place, but when somebody slips by, we're here to quickly discover you know, these footholds, these way these attackers maintain the long-term access. But the reality is, is you know, that's, that's a little too late. And it's great to be able to quickly discover those before the situation escalates. But if you could possibly cure that, anything that you could do to help prevent a little bit more, that ounce of prevention is still once again worth that pound of cure. And we're and there, so you know, I, oh, what's that, brother? So he's installing TeamViewer right now, right? So so they've so this hacker's identified that he's actually in a POS system, which might be more valuable because if I'm a hacker, what am I actually curious about? And I'm, I find myself in a POS system. I'm I'm not worried about spreading ransomware to other machines from that POS. I'm trying to get credit cards. Yeah, that, that's twofold, right? They're equally worried about this, uh, you know, MSP enabling two-factor, right? If they got into Screen Connect today because they had access to the credentials. But let's be realistic, like that MSP could flip on two-factor tomorrow. They could change their passwords. Obviously, after all these machines, and we saw this, the machine actually got ransomed here in this video. But the reality was they're just as worried about somebody putting on two-factor. So they put in you know, in this case, it was TeamViewer they used for a long-term persistent access. So in my demonstration, I'm going to kind of do a, uh, you know, a, a, a role-playing scenario where us as the audience can kind of play, what would we do once we get some of this access? And notice they're even configuring ba real basic passwords to prevent somebody else from getting into their own TeamViewer. I mean, it was a four-character password, so let's, let's be realistic. It's not, uh, not that secure, but here we go. So that, that, I think that was a great introduction of what you know, what the risk is. So now let's look, right? We've got our own attacker here. He's on the outside or she's on the outside and we scanned it and we take a, take a look at the result of this. It said, hey, I tried to scan this operating system and I came up and discovered that the computer's actual name is Victim PC. Based on what I'm seeing, it has a handful of ports open, right? And we see it actually was pretty darn good. It was able to fingerprint that based on SMB, it had a pretty good idea of what version of Windows 10 it was. Right, we see this isn't on bleeding edge. It's a couple patch updates behind, but that's not crazy, uh, you know, in reality. And what's funny about this is we're not going to actually 
attack any real vulnerabilities more along the lines of misconfigurations that could be leveraged. So in addition to that, we see good old fashioned 3389 open. And this is one of those that even if SMB open to the world is really uh, a bad security practice, right? That's a file sharing. I continue to kind of harp on like, you know, none of us should ever uh, have SMB open except every day I kind of run into one of these. And so, Jeremy, have you ever played on Shodan? And I'm totally okay if you haven't, but uh, Shodan is a free service that you can use online. You can log in and you can actually go in there and type in like, hey, I want to see everybody on the internet with port 445 open. And so I did that right before this example. Actually, I had my team, um, the Threat Ops team, take a look at this. And they said, ooh, uh, the number of hosts right now are almost 400,000 as of this morning. If we go take a look at this, and some of these hosts are flat out have their actual C dollar, D dollar shine, users directory, all kinds of things shared. The reality though is if you have these type of things that are open or require authentication, I think you know where I'm going with this. If somebody gets into your network to be able to see some of this data, obviously without having a password or disabling uh, or you know enforcing authentication is going to be that place where two factor could save the day before Huntress really has to come in there. So let's take a look at what we would do, right? In this example, it was 445. So one of the free tools within Metasploit is a brute force capability called SMB login, right? And so if we take a look at my other Windows machine, and I can go ahead and, you know, I won't even log on for the sake of this demonstration. It will just eat up some of our time. Um, I'm gonna set the host and the IP of that Windows 10 machine is 86.34 here. So the attacker would put in you know, 86.34. And next thing they would have to do is maybe guess, like, what is the user that is often on each machine? And most folks go the lazy route. When I'm looking at our partners that constantly get compromised, either through SMB, RDP, or password reuse, um, it, it's typically something like a built-in account, like a scanner account, or oftentimes they just go for the lowest that they through, and they go for the administrator account, right? Well, why get crazy and why get sexy when you could just do something simple? Another one of these that we could take a look at, and, and I wanna kind of show it here so I don't have to retype all the shenanigans, is Metasploit has a feature that it ships with all of these uh, built-in password lists. So Jeremy, after you know a big company, I think you can turn the news on every day and you hear about a new company getting breached and their password is not being salted or not being encrypted. So everybody was able to see those passwords. Well, Metasploit actually keeps track of these like large breaches. And so it's really often that you'll actually have attackers just using these common or like the most common thousand passwords from a breach to use it to get into a network. So let's take a look here. So we set, we said we wanna go after the host 8634. We wanna go and try to log on as the administrator and we're gonna try every password in this password list. And so we can fire away. And if you take a look at this, it's, it's not the fastest log on, but it's going through all these common low hanging fruit passwords and as shocked as I, I am to say it, even though these are super basic, they still to be, continue to be the most prevalent, right? So this is that case of passwords are weak, hence the whole premise of why a second factor is important. Password so reuse and phishing put all staff at risk, not just these privileged accounts, because they can once they get something from any uh, user account on the system, they can start using tools like this to pivot to privileged accounts. Yeah, so we see here, we successfully authenticated uh, and, and we're actually able to find out. And if we take a look at this administrator, I can't tell you like how often, even in my own experience of doing offense, how often it's just one of those silly keyboard walks, right? You hold shift, you go up, and then you go down the keyboard or whatever, letting go of shift. Sometimes I actually have full on dictionaries that are nothing but these passwords. Um, so let's think about that, right? The attackers now got administrator passwords. And so a lot of times attackers think just like a system administrators, like, hey, if I wanted to remotely execute a command on this computer, I want to use PSExec, which is a, an awesome capability. And it turns out this uh, hacking framework has its own version of PSExec. And if we take a look, I've gone ahead and already set some of these options in advance. So I said, I want to go after host, excuse me, that says 40.86, let's go ahead. Oh, that's uh, calling back to me, sorry. I want to go after host 86.34. I'm going to try to log in through SMB over port 445, and I'm going to use administrator and that new password that I just recovered from some of the brute forcing, right? So that's uh, obviously that's them starting to weaponize some of this data. But if we take a look here, when the attacker goes to compromise this machine, they get no dice. 
And this gets really technical really quick on why this doesn't fail. But what happens is Windows 10 and most versions of, I guess it's technically been Vista onwards, has UAC enabled. And so what happens here is they tried to remotely put a file onto this computer and they had not actually succeeded in bypass the authentication of UAC, which is that, you know, sometimes annoying little pop-up that says, are you sure you want to be able to run this? So what happens is this attacker here in this scenario, they're low hanging fruit, right? They're not nation state. They just realize, oh, my built-in script kitty tools don't work. You know, I, I can't get in. And so what happens is they're left with, with nothing here. They, they wanted to execute some PowerShell, but it said, oh, I can't succeed. I don't even know why, even though I'm telling you why. It's because UAC was enabled, that this failed. They can't get in. So often what happens is attackers pivot to other ways. And we actually see a lot of this, Jeremy. Um, obviously, the whole one of those is, is if uh, you know, two-factor was enabled, even if they were able to successfully authenticate, it would require some type of two-factor pop-up that, that matters. So there's equivalents of these, though, for remote desktop. And one of these free tools is called Hydra. So if we take a look, I've already typed the command here to save us, but we're already saying, hey, as the administrator, we're going to use that same fast track capability. So say, for instance, in this scenario, maybe remote desktop wasn't open at all, and all we saw was 3389. This attacker could have started this whole approach and said, I still want to use that common password list, but instead of authenticating over SMB, let me try to brute force RDP. And it's the same computer here, and if we take a look, it's going to fly, right? I'm just kind of crushing the remote desktop service with failed logon attempts right now. And if you take a look, this password list is only 222 things, but it still comes to the same conclusion here, Jeremy, which is the password succeeded, right? It was able to log on and succeed with this brute force. So and you Kyle, have this tool that you're using, uh -huh. like you're a hacker. Did you write this or no, is the, this just publicly are, available? Yeah, publicly available, free as in you can go, I mean, <laughs> Here's the shameless plug for the developer. You can actually go to his GitHub, clone the, the repo, and, and, and build this tool for free. I did that probably about an hour and a half before this demo started to make sure everything was working. So, you know, so this isn't something tools. that you have to have a extremely high no. level of like AppSec Intel. You, this is somebody, anybody with a lot of spare time can go figure out and that are technically inclined. So that, that's why. Uh, this is they, they've democratized hacking, if you will, and yeah, so we got to stay. Yeah, it's a commodity ahead. for sure, right? It's it's definitely you don't need to be former NSA cyber warfare operator. You could be you and I. I mean, Jerry, my, my my sales team goes through a class that's just like this to be able to do these, just because it really is something that we all can do. However, let's be real, MSPs, right? We don't we we kind of know this is the case, but our clients in the SMB, right? That that healthcare, that law firm, that, uh, you know, maybe the pet store up the road that has six computers but just needs you to take care of it and make sure everything's running so they can charge. They definitely don't understand that this is so easy. So the part of the reason of doing this demonstration is to really kind of weaponize and motivate our MSPs as well to be able to show these type of things rather than just tell. So, but what really hits close to home though, Jeremy, is not just seeing that brute force, like, right, we, we saw a pretty green, hey, password succeeded, but I'm a real big fan of, show me don't tell me so let's let's make this demonstration get real real quick so i'm using the built-in remote desktop capability within linux it's called our desktop and if we take a look the command is super simple what ip what username one password and this could work the same way as if you were on a domain i'm just doing this because it's two local vms and it's nice and easy to show this but let's be real here if i'm logging in and clearly two-factor wasn't leveraged this is where having you know duos mfa uh, or you know any sort of 2FA at that point, logged in and set up within Active Directory, right? Duo would have saved the bacon here, even though there was a weak password policy, even though there wasn't a uh, account lockout policy, because right, think about that. We just went and tried 212 passwords in a row and that user didn't get logged out, uh, locked out. Yeah, shouldn't have been possible. Yeah, but I mean, Windows 10 ships without auditing on logins. It ships without the complex uh, password policy and it ships without lockout periods. So this is often representative of, or it represents a case where, oh crap, my laptop stopped working. Go to Best Buy and buy one real quick. And then you know it got added to the domain, but for whatever reason, group policies didn't update, or maybe it never got added back on the domain. Like this is reality. Perfect security and, doesn't happen. 
and so how we here. see this on our side is people swiping a credit card and without talking to anybody at Duo, they are now using they're protecting RDP instantly and they're pushing out via GPO RDP to protect every client and server on the domain because this happened to them and now they're like having that oh no moment and the first thing they do, swipe a credit card, start protecting RDP with Duo and then they make a common mistake of thinking, okay, cool, we're done. Yeah, and, and that, that's 110% like see it every day. I mean, maybe to, to reiterate, right? This was all about halting hackers, uh, right? With Huntress and Duo. I can show the the Huntress approach and I'm telling you, it's it's not the greatest of, of things when you can actually put something like two-factor in place to be able to minimize this. So here's a good example of one of our reports. It's been redacted so we don't you know shame anybody here. But that's us why. Oh, sorry, while you're pulling that up, uh, Kyle, we did get a related question in. Uh, somebody was asking in that demo that you were just sharing, is that a setup machine or one chosen from the open 3389 list? Uh, that, oh, good gosh, that is, I'm not hacking somebody on the internet. <laughs> let's, let's clarify that for all legal side of the house. Please don't sue me. No, um, this is that 3389. It's just this local VM here that I have set up, right? I could. A good example of this, right? I could actually log into this VM. It says another user is signed in. Do you want to sign in anyways? And what we should see here is when I click yes, this user is going to get prompted. Do you want to allow victim PC? So yeah, we didn't just grab a computer on the internet or hacking it. That's what hooligans and charlatans do. So thank you so much for whoever asked that question. I, I was going to say, are you sure that wasn't one of uh, Huntress's lawyers just looking out for you, making sure we're covering covering I the mean, bases? <laughs> I mean, you know, either way, um, I try to stay out of handcuffs. Like that's a right. crazy idea, but I like love my family and love my job. So no. Um, uh, and Kyle, we, it doesn't look like we have any questions in the uh, in the chat yet. So can you give a uh, update on that on how to do that? Yeah, so yeah, we've got about 50 folks that uh, joined us. So welcome everybody. Uh, just as a reminder, separate from our chat menu, you have a questions menu in your GoToWebinar uh, control panel. Please feel free as we go through to add any questions there. Uh, I will try and keep an eye out to ask uh, related questions while we're still on that section. We're holding time at the end of the session to go through all of them. Uh, and we did get uh, another question in. Um, for the uh, demo that you were just doing, Kyle, does that attack only work if uh, the connection is from uh, a local network or an external network? Would having a VPN uh, intermediate connection set, would that make a difference here? Yeah, it, um, the attack will work if you expose it. For instance, 3389 was exposed to the internet, but if you put it behind, for instance, a VPN, that would require the attacker to first maybe like um, and this is part of like lateral access. In one of my videos, I'm actually going to show uh, later. Um, I'll try to get to that type of video to actually show where the attacker couldn't RDP in from the outside because they had like a VPN in, in place or some type of gateway in place to prevent, you know, uh, external access. But I can't tell you enough. Like I know we, we kind of shamed real quick. We said, hey, port 44, uh, 445 is open just as much, right? And we we called out that. You know, I mean, this is how many people that have authentication disabled on Windows who had 445. But here's the same type of report done this morning for how many people had 3389 open directly to the internet. It's over 5 million endpoints. So I know we love to say, hey, nobody has 3389. And what type of crazy would, would put RDP uh, externally accessible on the internet? But the reality is every day I see the result. So yes, and great question. Look at where the majority of them are. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, the vast majority of them are in the U.S., so you can't even say that's not us. It is. Um, and Jeremy, one of the things that I, I was just setting up here while we were kind of uh, doing some of the housekeeping is that question of, okay, incident happens, we've got this thing going, what in the world should, you know, is a hacker going to do next? And Huntress typically finds these incidents because they were successful in brute forcing in, and then the hacker then creates a foothold. That's our specialty is finding out where people maintain that long-term access. So notice here, the hackers created what they call a backdoor using a feature built into Windows. I want to show how this feature works real quick because this type of feature, if you don't have two-factor from the get-go, these hackers come prepared and they, they're worried that you might turn two-factor on and might, you know, or the password might change. So I want to show you what they're doing and what a really common technique is to do here. So let's go back to this. This is my Windows 7 machine. 
And what I did here is these hackers, they'll go in and they'll log in through the GUI, right? We're in a nice pretty GUI here. And they'll create what's called an image file execution option debugger, right? Mouthful, I got it. But what they do is they go and say, hey, I want to make a, a debugger or I want to make a backdoor so that whenever one program runs, I'm going to make a new program run instead. And so if we go back and forth between my, my actual slides, we saw that this hacker went after what was called set HC. What a lot of people don't realize is in Windows, if you hit the shift button five times, right? I just hit it five times and voila, what came up was, do you want to turn on sticky keys, right? That was a program that automatically ran and now it finally came up in my VM. So since I've got two computers here, we've got the VM version and my Windows 10 host, uh, you know, came up as well. So watch what they do. They create a new registry value and this is going to allow them to maintain a backdoor. And we're going to see how this type of, you know, they're preparing for you to change your password or they're preparing for you to enable two-factor and they're worried about it. So this will be called debugger. And what happens is they say anytime that you run the program set HC, automatically run a different program instead. So what I want to show is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to disconnect from this machine and we're going to show what this hacker can now do so they're going to disconnect out of this machine and we're going to pretend that the system administrator kicked them out but only after they created that back door so they're going to try remote desktoping right back into that system and maybe they don't have the password this go around right and obviously in this scenario i gave the password so that's going to succeed but let's go ahead and uh, get this up and work in the right way trying to remote desktop in and we see here as we're, we're logging in, we have administrator, but we don't have the password, right? We can pretend that, you know, they, they just changed it, right? They're, they're foiled, incorrect user and password. Now watch this, and you, you probably can hear me with this mic. I'm going to hit the shift key five times again. And you're going to see that instead of actually the, the, uh, the sticky keys coming up, we got a command prompt that came up instead. And so watch what they can do. They type in, who am I? They're running a system. Because what happens is that debugger, or that backdoor, automatically runs as session zero, which is the login session here. And now they don't even have credentials. So from wow. the get-go, two-factor could have stopped this from getting in. And I think we realized real quick, like, all right, this is, this is scary. So uh, Zoe, I'm going to use this as the, the cue. Can you hit me up with the poll question, which is the, all right, we got access into this remote desktop machine because we brute forced through RDP because it was low hanging fruit and got in. Can you yeah. do this poll for me and ask them what should our audience do or what yeah, should we absolutely. do on behalf of our audience? Absolutely. And Kyle, go, go ahead, ahead, Zoe, sorry. Uh, I was gonna say, we got a few more uh, questions in that maybe we can do a little lightning round. Uh, Kyle, did you have to disable any options on your victim Windows 10 machine uh, in order to do the uh, brute force uh, password to try that many passwords in quick succession without being locked out? No, so this is a, a window, this is assuming that the GPO is set or the group policy is set that way and Windows okay. 10 ships natively this way. With that said, any security baseline analyzer, any GPO auditing tool would right away tell you, you should not do this, right? This is not a good idea. And I believe Microsoft is, is kind of stuck in a situation that, think about that, if they shipped a brand new laptop and they put a complex password policy and they put a, uh, you know, a, a, an actual lockout period, imagine if the user who doesn't have system administrators, just a home user bought a laptop and then they lock themselves out and they couldn't get in and then they're, they're without the password there and then they have to go through the password reset. So Microsoft really is in a place, just like as MSP, sometimes we have to do things because it's for convenience of the end user. Microsoft's really stuck in a rock and a hard spot here too. However, in a business setting, like this is a low hanging fruit. So um, I know the audience, sometimes it's, it's always shady when you see this firsthand, but every single day, Windows 10, Windows uh, Server 2016, 2019, we see the result of this every day. So this isn't one of those like blown up, like we're just hyping here, this is real. And it might not be real in your network because you're actually doing good security baseline, but it only takes one new computer being added into that client that you didn't have your GPOs configured. So that's one of those things we'll get into a little bit later. Um, the last piece while we're kind of running this poll, um, you know, my, my question always is, 
you know, should they have been able to see some of these things? Like, I think one of the questions was, you know, as an attacker, shouldn't there been some side of a walls, right, that I'm generating some type of like really, really noisy uh, thing that was going on that, that should have like alerted somebody? And Jeremy, you got any guesses? I know it's it's never fair to do this to some of the uh, sales team, but um, you know, one of the things that that actually is built into a lot of operating systems. Windows Defender probably should have caught it. What yeah, if they were running an antivirus that might have caught it? Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. So there could have been antivirus maybe, but a lot of times antivirus doesn't look at logons. Uh, Windows Defender is starting to add more and more to it that actually handles some of these. And what I'm failing to do here real quick is I'm failing within my, my little VM to open up one of these built-in features, which is called the event log. And so the event log is an actual feature within Windows that you can go and see every single, um, gosh, and I really am failing hard at this, which is uh, silly and sad. Um, so while you're, while you're working on that, so we got some results in from the poll, 6% install ransomware, 10% disable antivirus, 44% collect all saved passwords, 40% expand into other computers. So from, from already on, from our audience, though, what they're most concerned about is collecting other passwords and expanding into other computers. All right, you guys are definitely shady, you're guys and gals, so I appreciate <laughs> that. So um, are, are they still able to see my screen here, Jeremy? Because I think that, yep. that, that's a perfect way to segue into this, uh, to, you know, of where we're gonna go next. So one of those things somebody always asks me is like, oh, hey, I should be able to see those logon attempts in the event logs. You know, event logins, failed logon attempts, an account was logged off. You start seeing some of these type of, uh, you know, scenarios where we see there's, you know, a lot of login and log outs and users trying to come in. But the reality is we should have seen way more than just the handful here. We did almost 200 of these login and notifications. And what happens is a lot of times when we go to a network, we'll see that the default security policy, which I'm gonna open up in this tiny little screen here as I try to make it happen, you can actually look at the uh, local policies and what they're auditing. And by default, this machine has not been like purposely tailored. It just hasn't been configured to say, I wanna successfully audit my logins and logouts so I can keep track of those events. And now that I've set that setting, if we go back and we, we go to the top of my event logs here, I'm gonna do nothing more than kick off my, my Hydra you know, test again. I'm sorry, that was wrong window here. So I'm gonna go use Hydra. I'm gonna do a whole bunch of brute forcing. That's plenty, 38 failed logon attempts. And I'm gonna to try to go back into that uh, VM to take a look. And we should be able to refresh and see that when we refresh these logs, by adding these new auditing, we should see all within one second, take a look at these. There's gonna be, you know, log on special log ons, credential validation. And take a look at this. The computer attempted to validate credentials for the account. And I know this is super tiny here, Jeremy, so I'll scroll. And it even says, log on account, here's where I was trying to get into the administrator account. And notice remote desktop requires a parameter that, you know, can be spoofed, but it tells you what was the source computer. Because I was using a built-in tool that doesn't try to spoof it, it even gave away my computer name was Kali Linux. So that's a pretty, you know, huge benefit yeah. of when we're talking about halting hackers. Obviously, you can go the pure huntress approach, which is whenever they get in, I'm going to have somebody there for me to find it quickly before it escalates. That works. But I'm a much bigger fan of let's put some two-factor and let's put some auditing in place so we can find these in other ways as well before the successful login happens. So um, with that and said, is, the, are the, is this example, is this something that you could expect a, a common, uh, there, there's many common antiviruses in the MSP space, web root, carbon black, Sentinel one. Is this something that those would even catch at all? I mean, it depends on, on how things are configured. And it, uh, a lot of times it's going to be, you know, something like a SIM where even a carbon black might be able to audit this data. It really depends on how things are tweaked, how things are configured. There's just a lot of products that do different things. And I think as MSPs, it's a really hard to figure out what each product does that the other one doesn't overlay. So yes, there's definitely some products out there that get really expensive quick that will focus on like brute force attempts and logons to help you. Um, there's one within and the channel. These footholds are what Huntress it really identifies as kind of your bread and butter, right? Yeah, and that's our bread and butter, right? So there's so many other things like antivirus that looks at what is the behavior happening, right? Heuristics, that stuff like your, 
your bit defenders, your web roots, your sentinel ones. And Hunter's we've got a different approach, which yeah. is we want to look for any way since my job was long-term persistent access at NSA. Our our whole whole thing is how do we find other shady folks that are also trying to maintain long-term persistent access? And we've got about 15 minutes left. I know you had some other videos you wanted to show. I do. So a lot of people said, hey, what's going on and what type of videos might be shown, right? With ransomware was, I think, the fewest, right? So only a few of us were going to go down the route of installing ransomware first thing. So for those few of us, let's take a look. And this is, once again, this is an attacker who got in, and we see that they had already got into Screen Connect. And the first thing they did is after the ransomware got caught, they said, hey, please, Malwarebytes, can you restore my uh, quarantined items? So here's them restoring the ransomware installer. And of course, they're choosing, yes, please re restore. So what's funny here is this is a good defense in depth strategy. So you know, theoretically, that file was supposed to be copied back. And you'll notice here in the, in, in the video, they even went and said, oh, I need to copy it. They're, they want to make double sure that this uh, start 1488, which is the ransomware. And notice they tried to copy it back and it told them access is denied. So this is that hacker once again that's really salty. He's like, no, dang it, I just want to be able to install my ransomware. So they're confirming, right? They take a look, yep, Malwarebytes is running. In Malwarebytes, you'll see they have a handful of different processes. One of them is anti-exploit. One of them is anti-ransomware. So they got kind of defense in depth going on. And once again, they tried to copy. And here's that second time's a charm, right? We check and we see, hey, yes, my ransomware file is installed. So this is the hacker, once again, a screen capture of their doing it. But they tried to run it and it exploded, right? It said, cannot access the file. So you can tell this hacker here is, they're, they're fed up, right? They just want to install the ransomware and go. So they come down to Malwarebytes and realize it has an anti-ransomware. And of course, they're going for the kill switch, right? I want to stop anti-ransomware. And Jeremy, this is that moment that always kills me, which is we, you know, say somebody got in a different way, phishing or something else. However, this attacker got control of this computer. This is that moment we all regret not adding two-factor, right? Because as soon as they put in that username and password, if there isn't a two-factor uh, authentication there, they're going to be allowed to disable this malware bytes and thus install the ransomware. In this scenario, it just happened to be the attacker didn't have any credentials uh, to the individual users. They only had access to the MSP credentials. But really, at the end of the day, they're one password away from malware or from ransomware at this point. So huge so kudos a couple, to them. A couple points. Uh, check out the timestamp on this video, 208 a.m. Yeah, a. Now you'll notice each of them are, are really early in the morning when everybody's sleeping. And so why is that machine even on and like logged in at that time? If it had 2FA on the machine itself, they wouldn't even got to that point with, of the video that we're seeing, right? And if they'd had a 2FA on screen connect, they wouldn't be able to use that to get into other things. There is all kinds of opportunity here where 2FA could have been the saving grace. Uh, so um, school me, I, I can't see the poll results, but um, tell me what again, what was what was our next? We had disabled, uh, ran, or sorry, install ransomware. 6% install ransomware, 10% disable antivirus, 44 save passwords, and 40 uh, expand to other computers. So that worked out well, right? We just got to see actually, you know, installing the ransomware and trying to disable the, uh, the antivirus. So we got to see those in the first videos. The very next one, one was it sounded like it was save passwords, right? Go after the save passwords. Forty-four percent. That's the top save oh, passwords. A, oh, we're not we're not going to give that one away then. We, we, was the next one? Uh, Forty percent expand into other computers. All right, you creeps. I figured you wanted to <laughs> So here we go. We've got once again they. This is a machine they get into, and notice this machine has a save remote desktop credentials. Right, so that's one of those shortcuts that are remote desktops into another machine. So they're already in the network using stuff like these shortcuts. And this, once again, is the moment where we wish if they got in, however they got in, where we wish they had two factor. And you know, just like the last scenario, they're having full control of the screen. So two factor would have stopped them from here. But if they didn't have control of Screen Connect, this would have been more than enough for them to be able to get their job done. And if you notice here right away, they first start trying to install ransomware and they succeed at installing ransomware on the host. And now this is back after they install that ransomware on the host, this is back within that new server 2016 server uh, that they remote desktop into. And notice the first thing they go for is QuickBooks files. And you know where this goes. Obviously I cut, some of these videos were minutes long, 
but this thing eventually became the same scenario, which was copy the ransomware installer into this QuickBooks folder and encrypt all of the you know payroll, all of the finances, everything that went in here. So I know that. When you say short. minutes long, like it was a long time, but we, when I some the main takeaway or one of the main takeaways from the last time I saw your uh, blog post with the Huntress team and you were looking at many of these videos. It was the same timestamp to the minute. A lot of these things happen in like under a minute and multiple machines are now ransomware in one, two, three minutes. These guys, once they get in, they're practiced. They know what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, they're seasoned, right? And this started, if you take a look once again at the timestamp there in that bottom right hand corner, I know it's, uh, we'll play it again. It's 1.18 a.m. And you see that they go in there like with speed. As soon as they remote in, the first thing they caught, caught their eye was this remote desktop. And they wanted to check to see does it work right and it, not only did the rdp file have the same credentials but once again that's that oh gosh i wish i had two-factor moment so i think that hits close to home and i, I see we're we're dwindling on time so let's uh satisfy everybody's needs with our needs with a home run which is that saved passwords demonstration so once again here's the same scenario they remote desktop into this machine or excuse me they have control of this machine and they've copied ransomware onto the desktop so here we go, they've installed the ransomware. The first thing they do after they, they run the EXE file for ransomware is yep, make sure ransomware is running. But once again, they're not here just for the ransomware, they're here for other things. So this is one of those real creepy scenarios where they start going through user files, just like we saw with the previous QuickBooks example. Notice here, this has a personal drive and take a look at that birth certificates is something they actually highlight over. Comics, you know, harmonica, maybe this person was awesome on the harmonica, but they really wanted to make sure everything was encrypted before they moved on. And now here's one, once again, one of those creepy moments. So they open Google Chrome and the first thing they do is examine the bookmarks and they go after the finance bookmarks, start auditing each one. Where do they bank? And you know where this is going. If people save passwords in the browser, this is how they're getting into computers, right? And notice in this example, they're actually using a password manager. And I think you know exactly where this is going, which is, oh gosh, that is the moment that if they don't have two-factor on that password manager and they happen to have that master password, things are going to go from really bad day to much, much worse, right? That's the expanding. In this scenario, once again, thankfully the attackers did not have the password to the master password, but I can promise you when you have someone like me on the other end of the keyboard, this is not my goal. Like my goal is not to get defeated by the first password prop that's there. I probably had a foothold. I probably already keystroke logged you, log in here to the RoboForm software, and I'm gonna authenticate. So once again, if you're using password managers, folks, you've gotta use this two-factor because these are the situations where, bad scenario, right? Let's be real. Ransomware where, I mean, we'll go back to that video or that part of the video. This doesn't get much worse than like your kids' birth certificates and Batman sound files and Quicken loans. This was a CFO, by the way. So we had healthcare and things like that. By the way, you know, and that's bad enough when you have your customers, you know, data actually being ransomed up. But like, let's be real, this is a bad scenario. This is a much worse scenario is if they get into here because it's just going to keep compounding and they're going to spread. So, Jeremy, I think that kind of ends my uh, my my demo. I know we went a little bit long, but um, let's pass some presentation back over to kind of end this thing and talk a little bit about. I think we've really hit close to home on why two factor is a great way to halt hackers. So you don't need to have the scenarios like mine. And thanks, Kyle. And Zoe, are there any questions from that segment that we should uh, address while the topic is hot? Yeah. So um, uh, one question here, does Huntress monitor event log as well as part of breach detection? That is not part of our stack. It's one of those things that we, we focus on persistence. It'll be one of those things that, you know, it's, it's not a, 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 an if, it's a when. But right now we're laser focused on footholds. And the reason for that is 80% of our trials we find attackers in just based on the footholds. So we're definitely not an end all be all, ditch your antivirus, ditch everything else. It is about layers. But once again, you know, I, I think somebody in the, the channel that specializes in these event logs is um, you know, probably a combination of, I think Perch Security might look at some of these. I think another one that's worth calling out is uh, Vigilant. I know for a fact they monitor event logs and they're channel friendly for MSP. So this isn't uh, you need to only run Huntress type of pitch. That's never our pitch. Yeah. It's always a layered uh, approach. 
And uh, we had a duo partner that joined uh, the call a little ways in and asked uh, where where Huntress intervenes. They saw you know the the demo, uh, but not uh, where where Huntress comes in to help with that uh, breach detection or remediation. Gotcha. So in the example, and I know I'm not screen sharing anymore, but if anybody goes back and watches it, after that attacker succeeds in brute forcing, we're focused on detection and response. So quickly discovering an incident before it escalates. So when that hacker remote desktops in, we would not see the successful remote desktop in because that's not something that we're looking at. But what we see is in like 90%, 92%, depending on the month, we see the vast majority is what I'm getting at of attackers that the very next step is let me deliver an effect. Let me maintain that long-term access because that's the economics of an attack. They want to maintain the very first video we kicked off was them installing TeamViewer or them installing that uh, IFEO debugger, that backdoor. So as soon as any of those persistence mechanisms or those footholds that attackers would use to maintain in there, that's when you're going to get a step-by-step -step notification of this is your incident. This is exactly what you need to do to remediate it. This is the computer it's on, all in a non-technical level. Um, so th that, that's where Huntress comes into play. And that's whether it's you know antivirus or malware, uh, you know backdoors, living off the land. It can sometimes even be ransomware. Sometimes we, we just find the notification where ransomware created a pop-up every time a user logged in that said, send me the Bitcoin. Yep. Uh, and then a uh, nice segue into our uh, duo conversation, we got a couple of Duo questions. So uh, does Duo work with normal logins? Uh, I'm assuming normal is local logins with Active Directory or only for RDP. Um, I know that one we, we can answer. You can do local or uh, remote or both. Um, difficulty with multi-factor is many users want the MSP to fix their profile specific issue by logging on as the user and often they are unavailable to provide the two-factor code. You're hitting a nail on the head, 110%. Uh, that is a real problem of, of two-factor, for instance, where convenience uh, can come into play. Jeremy, how do your partners handle some of this stuff? Because if a user is logged in, and for instance, if the MSP has to be impersonating that user to get the job done, is, is there a, a way? I mean, I wouldn't so, know that answer. Yeah, so one of the benefits of the MSP program uh, is in order to use Duo, you have to be a user in the specific subaccount for that you're protecting. So if you're protecting RDP, the MSP admin, in addition to just the actual uh, end user, needs to be in that account. And if you have duplicate admins as users in each Duo account, we remove those uh, systematically so that you don't have to pay for duplicate users and you can exist in every account. So you can actually use your own RDP account or you can use your own username to log in at, to that uh, client device and use your own two-factor. So it, it does add a um, extra layer so on both the uh, user, you don't have to log in as them, you can log in as your own uh, username when getting access to that device uh, based, and that depends on how you have this whole thing set up, but we care for that in uh, a number of ways. Uh, and finally, uh, does Duo protect access to RoboForm? Uh, Robo, we protect access to a lot of different um, password managers. I'm not sure off the top of my head if RoboForm, what version or what uh, methods of two-factor that they have as native in their console. Uh, so we'd have to double check into that. But and it, uh, it looks I'm, like it supports SAML, so I'm guessing we can do our, our SAML integration there, but we can double check too. Yeah, but most uh, most password managers have multi forms of uh, two factor, and if they have an OTP, which I'm sure they do, you could protect that underneath using Duo Mobile. It might not be a uh, from your Duo console protection that supports push, but you could still have it under one MFA app. Great. So we we looked at some of these. The, uh, Google put out some research recently talking about how uh, effective MFA is. Don't want to beat a dead horse here, but yeah, it is very effective against many different various common points of entry. And if it's better to have it before than after, because as you saw, there's long-term uh, ways that they can get around it once there are once you've already been compromised. So I think we are uh, in a place 
where we've got to start making some of the stuff mandatory. And so some of the future headlines that we're going to see in the MSP industry is what other industries have already done. Two-factor mandatory, two-factor mandatory, Apple making it mandatory for their developers. Webroot, as a result of some of the videos, the uh, breaches we just looked at and some of the ones that were uh, Webroot, they're using a uh, Webroot was actually used to make PowerShell commands from the Webroot product in a legitimate way because they had the right credentials. They now made 2, 2FA mandatory for their software. We're going to see more and more of this. So really, we get, and Kyle does a really great job of delineating between technical questions, technical issues, and sales issues. And one of the ones that we see a lot and we get a lot is MSPs ask us, hey, I'm having trouble selling my security stack. And one of my first questions is like, well, have you made Duo mandatory for all of your internal applications? How, like, if you're not using it yourself, if you're not mandating it yourself, you're not taking it seriously yourself, it's going to be very tough to try and sell it. But really, it's going to be a question of, hey, when you're putting your kids in the back seat of your car, do you ask them if they want to use their seatbelt, or do you tell them they have to? Do you give them a waiver and say you don't have to, you you don't have to use your seatbelt if you sign off on the waiver? No, you tell them they got to put their seatbelt on. So really, it's about securing yourself mandating that security internally and then getting to a place where you're comfortable enough with your security offerings built into your managed service practice not as a standalone stack but built in that you mandate it for your customers so what are some of those things what should we be focused on this is not an all-encompassing list but kyle and i go to a lot of events and we hear a we go to a lot of security sessions where people are really just pitching specific products and not talking about generally msp uh, things that you should be aware about in the community, threat intel sharing, what was good, because people nobody wants to mention names. Let's mention some names. So this is not Kyle and I endorsing these specific things. These are things that we hear all the time, and it would be worth your time to take uh, check out if you are not doing one of these things on the list. Uh, Kyle, again, not full encompassing list. Anything that we're missing here? Any uh, Any caveats you want to mention? No, I, other than we actually pulled all the data we could from the Huntress data set to be able to figure out what was the prevalence. Obviously, that doesn't necessarily mean best or worst. Maybe it actually means cheapest. But usually the popularity right starts, there's enough people that care about security, it's enough to beat it up, right? We saw this in the web group case of where their implementation of two-factor people were, were less than happy. And now it looks like web group's going to work to make that better. That's a good example of you know prevalence Maybe it takes an incident for that to come out, but at minimum, you know, it looks like we're, we're going to get it there. So I think it's nice to be able to actually share Kyle and Jeremy's, this is what we're seeing in the wild, as opposed to just taking a vendor neutral approach. And Kyle, speaking of, you guys have an announcement, right? Yeah, yeah. So we, uh, we, we launched a, a duo multi-factor authentication uh, capability, right? So uh, obviously after the events, Jeremy and I have kind of been working on this for a long time and making sure that Duo was a, a first-class citizen within the Huntress ecosystem, but even this, uh, you know, cost ourselves, which are our security experts, to take a step back and say, should we actually mandate multi-factor? Right? We don't have the similar capability of WebRoot, but if somebody could get into the Huntress portal, does that allow them to uninstall the, you know, the antivirus from our portal or our own capabilities to make us blind? So we're knee-deep in kind of assessing that right now. So yeah, stoked to be able to launch this, Jeremy, and. Uh, Glad to be a part of the Duo family. Uh, starting August 1st, this will already be a named integration in the admin panel. It will take a little while to roll out to every Duo instance, but you'll see uh, Huntress as a native integration there. And we're so thankful to have uh, you guys lead the pack. We're talking with Webroot. We're talking with other vendors. You'll see more and more of that in the days, months to come. But let's take a minute and talk more about uh, what we do and what we do for MSPs. Kyle, you covered some of this, but want to give them what they should be doing after the call. Yeah, never huge on, on a product pitch, but at the end of the day, that question somebody asked earlier, which is why do people use Huntress and how, how do you actually complement? Our whole goal when we started is you shouldn't have to hire people like me to be able to secure your network. So we try to make these incidents more manager, manageable by junior staff. You push out the Huntress agent to all your machines, all your clients, via the RMM, super lightweight. From that point forward, you set up your integrations into Duo, you set up your integrations into your PSA, and we're gonna do all the hunting for you. When we discover that hacker that slipped in past your preventative security, 
We're going to give you an easy to follow remediation step straight to your PSA or ticketing system, email, wherever you want to get it. And that's, that's pretty much it, Jeremy. I think that's a super high level, non pitchy pitch. And uh, Kyle and team are doing a really great job in the MSP industry as a whole of just raising the watermark and also encouraging the entire industry to share Intel. To uh, it, This is not necessarily our uh, core competence, but being able to have webinars like these, have conversations like these, shows what are happening. So if something does happen to you, please reach out to Kyle, share this information so we can disseminate it so everybody, the entire uh, industry is better off by knowing what's happening and how to prevent it. Yeah, thumbs up. The, uh, the MSP program duo, our entire, go entire goal is to make it really easy to protect yourself with 2FA. The partner program is built around making it easy to buy, easy to manage, and easy to grow. It's monthly consumption consumption base, only pay for what you use, uh, Make have APIs for automation. We give you free tools around phishing, doing phishing uh, demonstrations, demo site. What we're doing right now, you can for free use Duo to protect your help desk. Customer calls in, you got a new tech, you got a new customer. How does that person verify the other person on the side of the other side of the phone is who they say they are? Send them a Duo push. Very quickly, on demand, verify that person, the caller is who they say they are before performing that password reset. So your uh, help desk does not get socially engineered. We make that free to our partners. Feel free to reach out to msp at duo.com to learn more about that if you have questions. And we also incent internal use. So if you're a Huntress partner, you sign up on uh, the, the web page. We put four Huntress partners. We're going to give you guys a, a better discount. And if you are a current Duo partner, you want to sign up for the, uh, the Huntress trial, reach out to msp at duo.com, mention Huntress, and we'll get these the first two tiers consolidated for you because we want everyone to roll out Duo internally for your MSP app applications and all your applications. So overall, we have a higher water watermark. Kyle, what are you asking the uh, partners to do? Yeah, uh, obviously, they, I, I think I beat the, the dead horse in regards to let's get some 2FA in our lives. Let's figure out how to get, you know, work on the sales pitches around it. But the call to action is pretty simple. We offer a free 21-day trial that's going to show you your first three higher critical incidents. I'm a show me, not tell me type of guy. The whole company is based around that type of culture, and that's how this team works. So if you're interested in it, obviously, you can enable Duo MFA. There's links from there, but huntress.io slash register. No credit card needed. Jump into the trial. And, and uh, from there, it's just Q&A. So we're going to spot let stall on this page so you guys get the links. And Zoe, if there's anything else. Yeah, uh, we got a couple questions. Well, first, I know that we've got Hacker Summer Camp coming up here in just a few weeks, Kyle. Do you, uh, are you doing any uh, courses in uh, Vegas at Black Hat? And is it too late if folks are interested to uh, sign up or check those out? So we do the expensive courses at Black Hat every year. We've been teaching fuzzing for vulnerabilities for about uh, almost 10 years. And this is the very first year that uh, we, we decided that uh, we're going to put more focus on MSP events. So the team will be out at DEF CON and Black Hat. We're just not uh, not doing the, the classes this year. Cool. Uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, to our earlier question about uh, how an MSP would handle having to log in as a user, uh, they had a follow-up question asking, does that log you on as that end user? As a follow-on to our earlier question about if a uh, customer needs you to log in to make a change specific to their profile, uh, but has 2FA enabled. Did we lose Jeremy? I I don't see his image up here. Oh, can you hear me, guys? Oh, I can yeah. hear you now, brother. Sorry, I had to go get plugged in. Um, I, the question was that does that log you in as that end user? Uh, when you are using your own user, no, it does not. If you want to log in as that end user and that end user recalls for 2FA, you're going to actually uh, have them. Be, you'll need to be like on the phone with them so they can uh, do their two-factor for their user because it's. Duo is specific to the user ID. Also, if you do have the primary, uh, if you have the end users credentials that they've provided you to do support and you're administering their Duo account, you would be able to generate a bypass code, a one-time use bypass code to help with that. In that instance, you would be able to log in as that user, but would require the user's authorization. Good call out, Zoe. Uh, 
what's the pricing for Huntress? Yeah, so Huntress's pricing is super MSP friendly. Starts at two dollars an endpoint a month, based on a hundred minimum. We do also have a pay-as-you-go. Everything is consumption-based, and pay-as-you-go for MSPs is two dollars and fifty cents a month, and it can go all the way down to a dollar twenty-five based on volume. With that said, uh, you know the whole thing is designed around MSPs, several hundred MSPs that use our product. Uh, so it's it's one of those that you're not going to find any weird oddities. Uh, when it comes to your clients, you always have 100% margins for upsell as well. Um, so thanks for asking that. Awesome. It looks like that's it. We were able to work most of them in as we went, and I know we ran over a little bit. Um, if, gents, any last uh, kind of recaps or, or takeaways that we want to make sure folks are walking away with? My, my team hit me up with two, which are, are one is ridiculous and one's legitimate. The first was we do major hacking classes, like at IT Nation, for instance, is the very next one that we do in October. We do a five hour or four hour hacking class where we actually do the same type of labs what you saw. Um, it's not a sales pitch, and it's available there at uh, ConnectWise's event or IT Nation Connect in October. So that pre-day event is there. The last one I got shamed for, the reason I'm wearing a jacket was I was supposed to do my hacking demonstration. Oh, see? with the hoodie on but uh, clearly I uh, you know I failed at that one so uh, this wasn't so much a, a uh, question as a shout out somebody said Huntress just works and the hacking class is very good oh nice huge thanks uh, is there any special uh, this I believe is also for uh, for Huntress is there any special pricing for ITN Evolve 3 members ITN Evolve 3, I, I generally speaking, uh, you have to hassle sales. I don't believe they do any uh, special pricing. Okay, cool. It looks like that's it. So, uh, gents, thanks so much for hopping on and sharing this information today. Thanks for all of our uh, to all of our attendees for joining. We will be sending out the recording of this uh, webinar uh, to all registrants. So if you want to go back and rewatch or had to join partway through, you'll be able to see all of the exciting demonstration. Uh, and thanks everybody for joining. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Hunter's team. Thank you guys for having us. It was awesome. Bye-bye, all.